giving everyone just a second to hop on here. Thanks for joining us today for this Zap chat. A couple of quick housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, you should notice that we do have live audio transcript enabled for this afternoon's webinar. Uh, that is something where if you find it distracting, you can click on the CC icon in the bottom of your screen and that will allow you to either hide the live subtitles or move them if you would like them to appear in a different area of the screen. Um, we will be holding questions uh, till the end after all of our panelists have presented. That said, you will find the Q&A box also at the bottom of your screen if you have questions throughout uh, that you would like to add in for our panelists today. Uh, that said, if you also have any technical difficulties or the like that we can assist you with, please put those in the chat as well. Otherwise, we'll go ahead and get started um, with today's Zap chat on disease updates for the zoo and wildlife community. And I will turn that over to Zap's Senior Veterinary Advisor, Dr. Yvonne Needler. Hi, thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, we're really fortunate to have uh, a great lineup of speakers for you today that are really hot topics. Um, I will introduce them um, briefly right before they talk, uh, but we also have uh, at the end of our last presentation, Dr. Scott Kramer is with us and he's going to talk a little bit about um, a presentation that he has developed for the, the zoo and wildlife community and he'll uh, have an opportunity to pitch that a little bit at the end of our disease discussion today. So I will be thrilled to introduce to you Dr. Victoria Hall. She is currently the director of the Raptor Center at the University of Minnesota and a previous uh, veterinary Yay. epidemiologist at the Smithsonian. So I will silence myself here and let Dr. Hall take it away. Fantastic, thank you so much. Give me just one second to get this one going. And hello everybody, it's so wonderful to virtually get to talk to you today. I am going to talk a little bit about something not COVID related to kick us off. Um, I joke with uh, our, our donors and our staff and our, our supporters about uh, the one saving grace of COVID is it doesn't appear to affect birds of prey at the Raptor Center. Um, but today we wanted to take a little bit of time to talk about another virus that's out there that's still very much relevant um, that we need to have on our minds as we still put all these efforts towards responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. So before SARS-CoV-2, we had influenza, right? Influenza viruses, that was the big thing that we were worried about causing a global pandemic of a new virus strain that was circulating. Um, we know influenzas come in different types, A, B, C, and D. We worry about A and B because those are the seasonal epidemics of disease. So that's simply what we call in the human world, flu season. A though is the one that has been shown to cause the global pandemics of the flu. So when a new and different influenza A virus emerges and it infects people and it can go person to person, it's kind of like the you know, outbreak perfect storm we all talked about before the COVID times um, that we've been seeing play out. Um, type A is also the type that we see in different species of animals and also the type um, that we worry about zoonosis. So it going um, or animals into other animals. So type A is what we're gonna focus on today. So just because we're gonna be talking about this and we've got folks from all different backgrounds, um, type A influenza viruses are divided into subtypes. And these are based on these two proteins that live on the influenza mo molecule. Um, you have the hemagglutinin molecule, which we'll call H, um, and the neuraminidase molecule that we'll call N. Um, so that's how we're going to be classifying them because we're going to talk a little bit about types coming up. Um, with the H groups, we've got 18 subtypes and the N groups, you have 11 subtypes. So you can do the math. You can have a whole bunch of different combinations of type A influenza. Now, when we're talking about influenzas, you use that H and N um, combination. So for example, H1N1, but we also talk about the species of origin, right? Because this talk is all about avian influenza. Um, so they name type A influenzas, the H and N, but also about the species of origin. So we talk about swine flu or we talk about avian influenza. Now this does not mean it cannot go to other species. It just means where it originated. So avian influenza in particular, when we think about avian influenza, 
um, we think about natural hosts of this virus, okay? Um, wild birds, mainly wild aquatic birds. We think about wild ducks and geese and swans and gulls and shorebirds and terns. Um, it was originally thought that these birds just served as reservoir hosts, meaning they could get the virus, um, they didn't get sick from it, but they could shed it and infect others. It's actually a nifty trick of viruses to have reservoirs. Um, if it killed everything that it went into, then the virus would die out quickly. Reservoirs help viruses persist in the world. Um, it's been shown now though, that there are strains that cause some severe illness or death um, in these wild birds as well. Um, but you know, as a general broad statement, they tend to be more likely to be asymptomatic um, and just carrying it. Um, what this means though, is that they can spread different strains all over the world. Um, in fact, influenza A virus strains have been isolated from over a hundred different species of wild birds. So if you find an influenza A virus in a, in a waterfowl, it's not exactly surprising. Um, to take it back home a little bit to the United States here, um, we know that these birds migrate great distances and this is a picture from the Delaware Bay area. Um, so red knots and ruddy turnstones in particular come from as far away as the southern tip of South America. Um, they come for the horseshoe crab eggs and that's where they pick up all the vital fat reserves that they need after a migration before they leave again. Um, what we also know though is that there is an amazing mixing bowl for influenza at this area, right? Because you've got birds coming from all over the place, they're showing up. Um, it's easy to transmit influences between birds. Um, and in fact, ruddy turnstones, for example, uh, there's been some really cool research that shows when they arrive, very few of them have antibodies to influenza. But when they leave, up to 60% show they have antibodies. So it just shows how much transmission is happening. So when we talk about avian influenza, it's also super important to talk about the difference in highly pathogenic or HPAI and low pathogenic LPAI. Okay, we, we know that avian influenza can be zoonotic, meaning it can go to people. Now, highly pathogenic and low pathogenic has nothing to do with people. Okay, it has to do with what kind of disease and mortality or death it causes in chickens in a laboratory setting. So how's that for a definition, right? Um, but it's important to know exactly what we're talking about when we use these words. So highly pathogenic avian influenzas um, cause severe disease and really high mortality. You can see mortality up to 90 to 100% in domestic chickens and sometimes as quick as 48 hours. Now there's lots of different strains and types as we said of influenza viruses. Um, so everything's a spectrum, but high pathogenics are gonna cause a lot of disease, usually multiple organs affected um, can have a huge impact on flocks. Low pathogenic uh, means the poultry might not show any signs of disease or just mild ones. So you're thinking of a chicken that has ruffled feathers or maybe a drop in egg production. Um, now, again, when we talk about human sides, humans can get severe illness from high path and low path strains. So it's important to keep those a little different in our head. Low path does not mean no risk. We're talking about people as well. Influenza viruses are masters of mutations, right? That's why you get a flu shot every year is you've got different strains and get different mutations and they can drift and shift their genetics a low pathogenic can become high pathogenic. So it's something that a lot of effort and surveillance on the human and the animal side goes in to look at what strains are circulating, who are we seeing it in, what illness is being caused. So how do we normally think about our transmission? Because this is gonna matter when we think about our own collections. Um, again, every, I heard it said once, every avian influenza outbreak starts with a wild bird at some point in the chain. At some point, if you go back far enough, you've probably found somebody who was shedding virus. Um, they carried it in their intestines and respiratory tract when they're not actually you know, sick with it, right? Or reservoir species. Um, then they can shed it in saliva or nasal secretions or feces. So you can have direct contact between an infected bird who's shedding and another bird. Now contaminated items though, is one of the main driving forces of spread of avian influenza. Um, we're worried about the people side of things. You know, people going from place to place, cars going from place to place, us shipping infected birds from place to place or infected waste products or items or things like that. Um, so there's a huge human side of how do we cause this disease to start to move around. So wild birds certainly can play a part, um, probably not as large a part as initially thought, um, but they do play a part in starting some of these outbreaks. Um, but then we know that outbreaks are made and amplified by the movements through um, other methods as well. 
So why do we care about zoo or uh, avian influenza? Obviously zoonotic disease concern. I come from a public health background as a veterinarian. Um, people can get sick and people do get sick and people do die from avian influenza. Um, it's not been shown to easily be able to go person to person at this time, um, but that's always a fear. Um, you, we see right now what happens when you have a virus that easily goes person to person. We also worry though, because of high economic importance. So if we put on just kind of our, our um, economic hat here, um, the poultry industry is massive and you have huge trade implications when you have a high pathogenic avian influenza outbreak. So there's a lot of global stakeholders who are very concerned about avian influenza. And then you also have rapid spread and significant illness and death in birds when you have high pathogenic strains. Again, initially it was thought that some of the wild birds were more just reservoir species, but now we're seeing some high death rates in them as well with certain different strains of avian influenza. Um, so important not to just think of it as um, a poultry disease, um, but it can cause significant illness and death. Um, and when we're looking at it because of the economic and trade impacts and because it's so important to the agriculture setting, um, a lot of the mitigation tactics when we have an outbreak is culling and depopulation. So that's when it gets very important to the zoo world because this is not the method we would like to use um, if the zoo world gets involved uh, with high path AI, right? Um, so looking at the, um, the mitigation and the depopulation and the culling of domestic chickens uh, makes it even more important that the zoo world has solid preparedness plans um, ahead of time before things happen. Because we have a lot of birds in our collection, right? We've got a lot of birds of high importance, um, endangered birds, um, birds that are genetically valuable, and just also birds that we have the responsibility to in our collection. Um, so having that preparedness is so important. Um, and it is awesome because the USDA has even put out statements um, talking about um, the fact that zoos are a bit different, right? That it's the USDA APHIS, so the Animal Plant Health Inspection Service, which you'll hear USDA later today, but COVID, I think, um, policy is to work to determine the best course of action. There may need to be unique, or there may be unique circumstances which need to be reviewed by APHIS and state officials during an outbreak. So basically, and not a cookbook recipe of what happens when zoos are involved in high pathogenic avian influenza outbreaks, but that you have a real opportunity for advanced preparedness conversations and relationships. So how can avian influenza get impacted with zoos, right? Um, zoos have gorgeous exhibits usually outside, uh, completely open air areas with unflighted birds, um, netted areas and flight runs and, and caged areas um, where we do have the real possibility of wildlife interacting with our birds. Um, I know we had some you know, issues at the facilities that I've worked at in the past. So you do have opportunities for wild birds to interact with our collection birds. We also have opportunities for inadvertent admission of stuff into our facilities, right? So with employees that might work with birds in other settings or other venues um, could pose a risk, um, as well as some facilities are using wild caught um, shorebirds and waterfowl in collections. So bringing wild birds into your zoo, you can inadvertently import a problem. And then it's also really important to be aware that when there is a high pathogenic avian influenza incident, um, there are rings drawn by officials who respond, right? Rings where um, it might involve euthanasia of birds or quarantine of birds and things like that. Um, so there is a possibility of falling within a response ring um, for an avian influenza response. So <laughs> we've been doing COVID a long time, but High pathogenic avian influenza is in the world and it's probably in the world to stay here. Um, so it's something worth keeping in mind. Here's just some headlines from the last couple of weeks uh, of what's going on in the world. Um, starting to see more and more in some wildlife species like whooper swans in Mongolia. Um, FAO, the Food and Ag Organization of the United Nations warning African states about avian influenza um, activity in South Korea, activity in Poland. Um, when we look at specific strains that are of particular concern right now, um, H5N1, which is a high pathogenic strain. So all of the high pathogenic ones that have caused issues um, for the most part have been H5 or H7. Um, issues with um, H5N1 causing issues in wild birds in addition to the poultry. Um, so there's been some interesting research studies looking at specific susceptibility of wild pastorines to subtypes 
um, of highly pathogenic avian influenza virus. Um, so this study, for example, looked at um, reed buntings um, and pale thrushes and found that they both were susceptible um, and that the buntings in particular had almost 100% mortality when infected with the virus. So again, shifting our mindset from you know, a chicken disease, right, to something that could impact our collection, could impact other sorts of birds. Um, looking in India too, um, having some recent reports um, of geese found dead at a wildlife sanctuary that also tested positive for H5N1. And then looking at H5N8. So H5N8 is doing a lot of stuff over in Europe at the moment. Um, and in fact, in the autumn and winter of 2016 and 2017, H5N8 viruses caused mass amounts of die-offs of wild birds in the Netherlands. So about 14,000 birds were reported dead. So most of these birds were tufted ducks and Eurasian widgeons. Um, so really kind of changing that mindset and the paradigm of wild birds as unaffected agents of high path AI to now you know, being susceptible to death in large numbers to high pathogenic avian influenza. So just that continued conversation of these viruses change and they shift and they mutate and they drift. Um, and what we think we know isn't always what we're actually seeing. And it's important to continue surveillance and continue to be vigilant. vigilant. Um, the UK, um, H5N8 as well, um, high levels of mortality, um, finding a couple dozen birds um, dead or um, sick, testing positive for H5N8. Um, same in Southwest England, looking at um, geese, but they've also had positive tests in peregrine falcons and mute swans and whooper swans and barnacle geese. Um, Russia's also confirmed some positive human cases of H5N8. Um, these people thus far have been asymptomatic at the time of, of my search, um, but showing that there can be transmission that happens, right? Um, and when you're looking at avian influenza, stuff can change. As well as dead seagulls in Dublin um, and new strains. So um, just continuing to broaden our minds of um, what we know is constantly evolving um, and species susceptibility is constantly evolving. So we know that HPAI is in the world, right? Um, so then the question becomes you um, and your facility, what happens if it becomes in the US? What happens if it becomes in your state? What happens if it becomes in your city or even in your facility? So preparedness, because that's what ZAP's all about, right? Even influenza was the example before we went into SARS-CoV-2. Um, and actually, in fact, we used avian influenza preparedness plan at the Smithsonian National Zoo as our scaffolding to create our COVID-19 plans, okay? Because it hits on so many of the topics. Now, it's really hard to put time to preparedness when you've got competing priorities, right? And especially in the zoo world, we all have so many different tasks and duties that we do. Um, COVID-19, I tell my staff, never let a good pandemic go to waste. COVID-19 is forcing everybody right front and center to create plans. You're making relationships with state and local and federal um, officials. Um, you're working on communication strategies. You're working on quarantine and vaccine and disinfection protocols and disposal of stuff and what to do if a positive animal and how do you protect your staff? And that is the exact same structure that you would want on an avian influenza plan. So it creates this real possibility of how can you harness that COVID-19 plan um, into an avian influenza plan, or even just that more general infectious disease plans, because a lot of it has the same gosh darn, you know, structure in it for what you're doing. Um, how do you make sure that you keep everyone safe and as prepared as possible? Um, because there is more, uh, more out there, avian influenza, again, it's not a current in your face problem, um, but when it is, uh, it's gonna pay to be prepared. And we've learned so much from COVID that we have that preparedness. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hall. That was great. Um, that's how I got involved in the zoo world 15 years ago was because of avian influenza. And we've learned a lot, but it's, it's still an issue, right? So thank you. And you guys, like I said, please put your any questions you have for Dr. Hall in the chat. And with that, we will go next to Dr. Haley Murphy. Uh, Dr. Murphy is the Deputy Director of Zoo Atlanta, and she's the Director of an internationally known Great Ape 
Heart Project. She's also the National Veterinary Advisor for the Gorilla SSP Species Survival Plan and for the APE Taxon Advisory Group. So I will let Haley take it away. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah, go ahead and share your, we're, you, you're not sharing, your, now you're starting to share your screen. Yeah, I got kicked out of Zoom there for a minute. I don't know why it does that when I try and share my screen. So you can see my screen and you can hear me. Okay, great. <laughs> That's a relief. Okay, um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, SARS-CoV-2 considerations for great apes. And I loved um, hearing Dr. Hall's talk <laughs> There are other viruses out there, right? I think we've been so consumed by um, COVID-19 that we may have forgotten to prepare for the other ones or forgotten our plans. So it's really important to remember that. So I'm gonna cover a little bit about just a little background of um, SARS in other animals um, before I jump into the, the apes. But this is uh, as of March 23rd, the cases of SARS-CoV-2 in animals in the United States. So the map shows you, it's a heat map of where the cases have occurred. And then on the other side of the, the map is the actual cases. And it's important to remember that mink seem highly affected um, and that's premises, not individual animals. So there's sometimes thousands of mink per um, mink farm. And as you can see, I highlighted what I'm gonna talk about today, um, some cases in some gorillas, which I'm sure you've all heard of because it's been all over the press. So um, that was the United States. So globally, um, this is the, the total. So it certainly has been affecting animals, not nearly like we see in the human global population, um, but it is affecting other animals. And like I said, the ferret or the, the mink is um, farmed mink mainly, but they have seen it in one wild mink that was thought to be an accidental release from a mink farm. And this just shows you the worldwide distribution um, I think, you know, a lot of this is, is um, not blue only because some countries aren't testing in animals as, as much as other countries. So I suspect this would be more blue dots if other countries were testing at the same rate as some of the countries you see here. Um, and I, I wanted to touch on this paper briefly before I dive into the apes because this paper came out earlier in the pandemic and really sent a shockwave around a lot of people read it, it looked at the, the experimental and theoretical susceptibility of species based on their ACE2 receptors. Um, we know that that spike protein on the um, SARS-CoV-2 virus binds to the ACE2 receptor. And so there was a lot of interest and there still is a lot of interest in what species susceptibility may be based on the um, receptors that the species have. So this paper looked at um, a bunch of different taxa and species in order to determine or experimentally um, theorize in some cases what the susceptibility may be. And when this came out, I know a lot of zoo veterinarians anyway read it, but also um, remembered that you know, experimental conditions don't always reflect real conditions. And so um, uh, it caused a lot of discussion in the zoo world about what to do with our animals because they broke out the risk categories based on the receptors into very high, high, medium, low, and very low. And some of our um, more common species fell into the very high and high. And so, you know, how to handle that. And I wanted to throw this in there because it's very important to remember that experiment, and I know there's a lot of words here, but basically experimentally induced infections don't mirror naturally induced infections very often. And so just because it's published in a paper that it, it could happen, usually those experimental conditions are under extremely tight circumstances um, with high viral loads um, directly put into the animal. Um, so I'm not saying it can't happen, but I, I myself had a lot of um, staff at different zoos email me about, you know, should we do this? Should we pull this animal off? Should we, you know, go extremely um, protected contact with these animals? And we really didn't know, especially at the beginning, what would happen. 
We did, though, suspect that great apes, because of their phylogenetic relationship to us, the humans would be exquisitely sensitive to SARS-CoV-2. And lo and behold, very late in the pandemic, <laughs> I think, um, we started seeing our first cases. And um, you know, the headlines popped up. First, it was San Diego. And then there was a case in a silverback at the Prague Zoo. Um, in the great apes. I do suspect that there's probably more cases out there, but they just weren't screened. Um, given the amount of apes that have close to very close contact with humans in um, either sanctuary settings or the wild or in zoos, um, I suspect we have more cases than just this, but these were the ones that were picked up. I wanted to refer to the ZAP homepage um, in this because it's a great source of information. Obviously, they host webinars like this also. Um, but just to call your attention to the fact that the APE um, tag, the Taxonomic Advisory Group, put out a statement at the very beginning of the pandemic um, just with some advice uh, and risk um, mitigation that you could do when handling your great apes. Um, that was way back in March, which seems like forever ago. It was only a little over a year ago. Um, we revised that statement in January based on the cases that popped up in San Diego. And just this last Friday, we released a vaccination statement, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about now on um, considerations if you decide to vaccinate your great apes for SARS-CoV-2. Um, all of these statements can be found on that ZAP website, along with some other websites. So I'm going to dive a little bit more into the San Diego cases, and I can't thank San Diego um, zoo and wildlife safari enough for openly sharing everything they knew. They've been absolutely fantastic as industry leaders in sharing information because that's how we're really going to learn. So kind of think back to my experimental slide to real life. So we crossed over into real life and it, I'm really so grateful that they had been so transparent with everything that happened. Um, so in their case, the most severe signs were in their older gorillas. So they had um, two animals that were over 40 years old and they showed coughing, lethargy, fatigue, <clears throat> excuse me, and reduced appetite. The moderate signs were in the adolescent animals um, and that was coughing, reduced um, energy or vitality and nasal discharge. And then the more minor signs were seen in the um, younger adults and juveniles, nasal discharge, slightly subdued and infrequent, infrequent coughing. So I think this mirrors what we would expect to see in the human population, right? So they very closely followed along with what we worry about in humans. Sorry, one second. Um, <clears throat> the first clinical signs in the troop were observed seven days after their last possible exposure to an infected staff member. So they ha did have a keeper that tested positive. Um, clinical signs lasted up to 21 days, and their older silverback, who's 49 years old, had the longest clinical course. Um, they did end up interceding or immobilizing the 49-year-old silverback and the 43-year-old female because they were clinically sick enough to warrant that kind of intervention. So I just wanted to refer back to what we see in domestic animals. So in domestic animals and cats and dogs that have been documented to be infected, um, they can be anything from asymptomatic all the way up to ocular discharge, nasal, nasal discharge, difficulty breathing, um, coughing, sneezing, vomiting, and diarrhea, very similar to what we see published on the pages for what to watch for with, with humans. Um, there has not been any documented death in domestic animals directly related to COVID. There's been a couple of deaths with underlying severe um, illnesses, but nothing that they directly attributed to COVID. So um, I did want to touch on this before I dive into vaccination, because I think one of the most important things to do is PPE, right, and try and mitigate the risk with your great apes or apes. So um, very detailed and intentional disinfection programs or protocols in your zoos will help um, don't forget to really look at your at-risk animal areas. So the species like the big cats and the apes that we know are incredibly uh, at-risk mink. Um, look at your keeper areas where are they taking their breaks? What is the disinfection protocols there? 
the animal food prepping areas and who delivers that food? Do they go into the holding areas? And then the enrichment prep areas. If you if your keeper staff um, preps your enrichment in a different location, are they wearing appropriate PPE? Um, you should have, and and most places have already done this, but <laughs> controls to reduce staff time indoors with at-risk animals, especially apes. So are they maintaining social distance whenever possible from the apes? Um, are they wearing the proper PPE when they have to get closer than six feet and try and minimize that time frame? You can consider staff medical screening. Uh, you know, we have um, at Zoo Atlanta, we ask all staff to go through a set of questions before they report to work. Some zoos are taking temperatures. Um, there's been a lot of controversy rather about whether that's effective, but at least you're, you're able to ask some questions at that time. And then think about increasing your airflow and the proper ventilation um, in your ape holding. You know, a lot of, especially the northern zoos in the colder weather might not have the best ventilation. So how can you increase that to decrease the amount of stagnant air and um, increase the chance of the virus being transmitted? Um, some considerations that San Diego went through um, were dedicated uniforms and footwear for those areas, foot baths to go in and out, um, gloves, always wear gloves, masks, um, fit testing, N95 masks is the best you can do. Now we all know that N95 masks, especially early in the pandemic, were very difficult to get. They are a lot easier to get now. Safety goggles and face shields, especially if cleaning or interacting closely with the apes. Um, Tyvek suits, uh, San Diego went to Tyvek suits once they had the diagnosis in their gorillas. Um, I think it's really important too, to go over the principles of putting on and taking off, donning and doffing, that's called PPE, because it's really easy to self-contaminate or contaminate other surfaces when you're doing this. And you wanna protect your keepers as well as your animals. Um, simple videos on the internet to be shared or um, you know, going through how to avoid cross-contamination is really important, especially for non-medical personnel like keeper staff or enrichment staff. Um, they, they might not understand or they might forget over time the principles of this. So reviewing this periodically is a good idea. And then maintaining clean and dirty areas to try and avoid that cross-contamination. I'm going to go into the treatments that they tried at San Diego. They did give monoclonal antibodies to their 49-year-old silverback. Um, these are antibodies that actually bind to the virus, to the spike protein itself. In humans, they're using these antibodies. Um, they're most effective in five to 10 days from the start of the first clinical signs in patients that are not severe yet. So patients that are ambulatory and not on oxygen or not oxygen dependent. Um, they gave 1,400 milligrams diluted into one liter of saline over 60 minutes to the silverback. And it's important to note that these were acquired through a contact from their county public health department and with approval from the FDA. They did not take this from the human medical supply chain. And that's really important to note. Um, and, and they were very good about communicating that. The other medications they were on, and like I said, these were the two most severely affected animals, the two geriatrics. Um, they had them on meloxicam, um, which is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. Uh, Serenia and odoncetron is an anti-emetic, and that was really um, anesthesia related to prevent them from getting nauseous and vomiting from anesthesia. Same with the famotidine, which is an H2 blocker. They did do um, a macrolid antibiotic azithromycin and septiofure, which is a more long acting um, broad spectrum antibiotic and of course fluids for support. Post procedure, the animals were kept on dexamethasone. So a steroid, which you've probably heard a lot about in the news being used in humans, very effective. That was on the advice of the um, COVID specialist from the MD side. Um, maintain the azithromycin and the male um, has cardiac disease. And so this is very common in, in gorillas, especially older males. Um, so he's on cardiac medication. So to vaccinate or not to vaccinate, that is the question right now. Um, these are some headlines taken right out of the, the press for San Diego. They did vaccinate their, um, at the park, at the zoo, sorry, they vaccinated their orangutans and their bonobos. 
I just saw another headline this morning, actually, at Oakland Zoo thinking about vaccinating. So um, the ape tag got together last week and discussed um, if we should give guidance or what that guidance should look like. And part of that research we did was researching what vaccines are even available in just the United States. Um, so we looked at Pfizer, Moderna, um, Johnson & Johnson, Zoetis, and Ultimune. And Ultimune is in clinical trials right now, so it's not broadly available. I'm not gonna go a lot into the vaccines because I think most of us have heard a lot about these vaccines, but I am gonna talk more about Zoetis because Zoetis is the only one and it's, it's awaiting a, um, or it's awaiting pending approval. The only one that's approved for non-humans and it's gonna be approved for mink. So the rest are all um, human vaccines and we've seen uh, mixed reviews on vaccine availability. And so I think before a zoo um, thinks about using any vaccine that's out there for humans, you really have to have some discussions about whether that's the right thing to do, given the fact that we're in a worldwide pandemic and vaccine availability is limited. And that's um, all I'm gonna say about that, but it, it, you really should consider um, if that's the right and appropriate thing to do. So it's important to remember that there is no approved right now um, drug for SARS-CoV-2 or vaccine for SARS-CoV-2 in animals. Sorry about that. Um, the FDA has not approved any drugs for the diagnosis, cure, mitigation, or treatment, or prevention of SARS-CoV-2 in animals. Um, and the USDA APHIS Center for Veterinary Biologics regulates all of these biologics, including vaccines, and they have not licensed any product yet either. Um, now that should come any day for the Zoetis vaccine, but it, it's important to remember that has not happened. Um, <clears throat> so when you're talking to your staff and your veterinary staff about vaccinating um, apes, it, I think the first thing you need to do is a risk analysis. Really look at what, what are your risks? What are your PPE practices? Have you reviewed donning and doffing? Do you have clean and dirty areas? How frequently are your staff within six feet for more than 15 minutes? Um, really look at those exposures. Do your public get close? Can they throw things in? Um, do you do tours of your ape facilities? Things like that. Um, the PPE is still going to be one of the best routes to go until we have more information about these vaccines. Um, and also strongly encourage your staff to get vaccinated. So the people that come into the closest contact the most frequently, it would be great, including your veterinary staff, if you can encourage them um, to get vaccinated. And more and more states are opening up the vaccines more. Um, the Homeland Security federal guidelines for vaccination actually, um, at least veterinary care staff and zoo and aquarium staff were listed in phase one in that document. That does not override your state and local jurisdiction though. So some states um, did not put veterinary staff and zoo and aquarium staff in phase one. So you have to go with your local recommendations. So like I said, San Diego did go ahead. They were able to get Zoetis um, vaccine and able to do their bonobo and orangutan vaccinations at the zoo. Um, this was considered experimental. The vaccines were used under uh, informed consent not taken out from the human supply. And they are going to, or anticipate vaccinating the gorilla troop in 60 to 90 days because they've been infected already. They have to wait the recommended 60 to 90 days or else the efficacy of the vaccine won't be as good. Um, cost of the, uh, so we talked to Zoetis and this is what they have going on. Um, currently, they're trying to produce this vaccine for the mink industry, and that's what the FDA and USDA are probably going to license it for. So because the mink in industry, the, and there's so many animals per production unit, these will be very large dose vials. They are willing to make 10 dose vials for the zoo uh, um, field, which is great. Um, and that will be very helpful because, you know, zoos don't need thousands of doses of this. Um, they're going to try and do it at a very nominal cost, possibly even a donation because of the conservation impacts through zoos. Um, they also have a lateral flow assay for antibodies. It is important to note that San Diego is not able to do any pre and post vaccine um, serology to detect for efficacy. 
um, but that they did not have negative side effects. So that's good. Um, they have not produced this, this lateral flow assay yet. It's still in research and development and they don't have a cost, but that would be very handy to have. Um, they're anticipating the timeline between June and July um, to have this vaccine more widely available. Um, like I said, it's in production now. Um, in order to receive this vaccine, and Zoetis will go through this with you, so don't panic and, and be taking notes madly, um, you need a USDA 103.3 permit to get this vaccine. You also need your state veterinarian to authorize this. It's very important that you reach out to them and an MTA or material transfer agreement um, just to make sure you're using it in the way that you say you're going to use it and you're not gonna use it in humans or other species. So we just did say that they really, it would be very helpful, helpful to them to know how many zoos are thinking of doing this and how many doses they think they'll need. Um, it is a two shot series um, so that they know how many 10 mil vials they, or 10 dose vials they need to produce. And this is a contact. Um, this is Dr. Hardem at Zoetis. He's a great guy. He was on the phone with the, um, all the ape tag veterinary advisors. He's willing to talk to anybody who has, still has questions. Please feel free to have your veterinary staff reach out to him. Um, there's also the uh, lab in, at Cornell that's willing to run serology to test for efficacy. So if you're going to do this, the um, APTAG veterinary advisors ask you to please coordinate with us. Also, you can reach out to me or um, Dr. Priya at Columbus Zoo and, and either one of us can help. That statement with that contact information is on the ZAP website, um, but they are willing to run these assays to, check for, to, to test for efficacy. Sorry, late in the day. <laughs> Um, there's some great resources out there also for people to look up. Um, there's a whole non-human primate COVID-19 information hub. Like I mentioned, the ZAP website is great, um, along with the CDC, USDA, OIE, there's International Primatological Society. There's a bunch of really good resources out there um, to refer back to and to monitor what's going on um, with publications and cases. And like I said, I can't, I can't thank San Diego enough for being so open and transparent. I wanted to briefly touch on that we have, the TAG has veterinary advisors for the great apes. And so, um, and pathology advisors, these are the people, any or all of us are happy to answer questions at any time. These are the gorilla advisors, Pam Dennis at Cleveland Metro Parks, Tom Meehan at Brookfield, myself at Zoo Atlanta. Sam Rivera at Zoo Atlanta, and then our pathology advisors, Linda Lowenstein at UC Davis retired. The veterinary and path advisors for orangutans are Nancy Lung. Um, at the, she's the editor for the Journal of Zoo and Wildlife Medicine. Joe Smith at Fort Wayne Children's Zoo. Rita McManaman is a path advisor at University of Georgia. Sushan Han at University of Colorado is a path advisor, and Linda Lowenstein at US, UC Davis retired. Chimpanzees is Kay Backus at the Tulsa Zoo, Catherine Gamble at Lincoln Park Zoo, and Karen Terrio is the Path Advisor at University of Illinois. And then for bonobos, Vicki Clyde's retired. Um, Priya, I can never say her last name, at Columbus Zoo. Um, for bonobos, Karen Terrio at University of Illinois. Any and all of these people um, are really up to date with COVID and apes and what's happening. So please feel free to reach out. Um, and get your questions answered. And that's the silverback at um, San Diego, his birthday last year. So I'm gonna leave it there. Thanks Haley, we really appreciate that update. Um, so what we're going to do is kind of tie it all together now with Dr. Lori Gage. And Lori is, uh, with the United States Department of Agriculture Animal Care. You, if you have big cats or marine mammals, you know her quite well. She's the specialist for those <clears throat> groups of animals. And uh, she's uh, an author, also a former zoo vet. And she's gonna talk to you today about her involvement with this One Health Federal Interagency COVID-19 Working Group. Um, because you guys need to know that you have friends in high places that are advocating on behalf of this industry. So I will let Lori take it away. 
Thanks, Yvonne. And I am wanting to um, share my presentation or start the presentation, but the block above the um, this is preventing me from pressing the right button. So I don't know how to get rid of this black bar across the top of my screen. Oh, wait, here we go. No. Can you hit slideshow? Can yeah, I can't. Slideshow? I can't hit slideshow because there's a black bar above the, where the slideshow to hit slideshow is, and it won't let me hit the button that says slideshow because. Can you go up to your the top and um, switch your view? It should disappear. I had that happen too. The on your slideshow itself, it should say presenter view or other view. Okay. Um. So if it's a piece of the Zoom, if it's the black piece that says view options, you should yeah. be able to change that temporarily. So do exit full screen for a moment and then it should shift where it is for you. All righty. Um, and you also should be able to click and drag it um, oh, somewhere I click and else. Drag it. I, I apologize because I, well, there I, I, okay, I was able to click and drag it. There we go. Okay. That hasn't happened before. Um, let's start from the beginning. All righty, now I can get rid of this. This this um, this thing is really in a bad spot, so I'll put it somewhere else. Um, all right, so I'll start by saying that I'm the um, I sit on the committee called the One Health Federal Interagency COVID nineteen Coordination Group. So um, we uh, are a group. Uh, Okay, there we go. We're a, um, a group of 21 federal agencies and I wish I were more familiar with Zoom because all these boxes are getting in the way of giving my talk. I apologize. Um, there, we're 21 federal agencies we re, and we represent uh, uh, multiple departments and uh, this particular group is chaired by the CDC and we coordinate with actually over 150 of governmental partners and what we do is we bring together representatives from key federal agencies um, who represent these multiple departments. And then we collaborate uh, to address the, all the technical aspects of COVID-19. So here are all the different agencies that are involved with our uh, interagency uh, uh, task force. And um, it's a very interesting call. We get on these calls about once a month and each one of these uh, each one of these agencies generally has a report. So it's really interesting. We've had NASA report on different aspects of what they know about COVID-19. I was always surprised that NASA is involved and, and, and uh, we have uh, Health and Human Services, of course, and then um, CDC heads it up. Um, so it's a, a very interesting call. And the, we have five subgroups uh, on this group, uh, task force and uh, we have one subgroup that addresses some of the issues with the companion animals and that's headed up by CDC. And then we've got uh, the animal diagnostics and testing task force or subgroup. We have the wild animal and zoo animal, wildlife and zoo animal task force that, and subgroup. That's the, the subgroup that I'm a member of. And then we also have one that covers livestock and environmental health. So each month we have this webinar where we have presentations um, uh, from the one, uh, CDC One Health office and it's coordinated by CDC. And we share news and we share key updates on guidance, resources, and we are able to tap into some of the most recent uh, news and science articles and this particular webinar, this one monthly webinar, will summarize all the animal cases of SARS-CoV-2, both in the United States and globally. And, and then we get updates on, on the coordination of One Health as, at the One Health aspect. So it's a One Health group, which is interesting. We collaborate with lots of different people, uh, you know, from the state and local tribal officials, non-governmental agencies, healthcare providers, veterinarians, industry, academia uh, and then the federal officials. So we are very good at collaborating with people to find out everything we can find out about this disease. So here are some of, this is a, a typical of a slide that we would see on our monthly uh, uh, talks. This is the most recent one. And e each time we're presented with, and we get links to all these different articles that are 
what's going on with COVID, not only in humans, but in animals as well. And of course, our subgroup focuses in on what's going on with the zoo and wildlife species. So you can see here some of the more uh, interesting, the mink farms are continuing to have problems and mink, this has been, so many more mink have been affected with this disease than any other sort of animal. So I, we find that to be highly interested. What, what are mink telling us about these pandemics? Can marine mammals catch COVID-19? So these are all interesting things that people are looking into. And some of my slides will be close to duplicates of some of the ones that, that, that Haley showed, but um, here we just have the, the map that you'll see of which states are most heavily affected by and has, have the most cases of, of COVID in humans. And then we also talk about all the disease, all the different sorts of animals that have uh, had the, been infected with SARS-CoV-2. And uh, so this goes all the way from the cats, dogs, tigers, uh, snow leopards, and of course the gorillas that we just heard about. Um, we link all the farm mink together when we're looking at numbers because hundreds over 100,000 farmed mink have been affected by this disease. Um, and these are the countries that are reporting animals testing positive for SARS-CoV-2. And this used to be a little bit more colorful map because it would, we'd have the suspected cases and, and but now you can see that the disease is present in a, a lot of countries now and it's been confirmed to be present in those countries. So the new cases in this last um, uh, meeting that we had, this was published in February, February 10th, but the meeting was in March. Uh, and we talked about this cougar at a wild animal uh, uh, sanctuary in Texas. And the animal just had uh, the similar clinical signs to some of the other big cats that we've seen. And they've mainly coughing and sneezing and the animal fully recovered. And again, it was another thought that the staff member, uh, a staff member had been the source of the infection for this animal. So as of March 15th, again, mirroring what uh, Haley had to say, uh, about 135 animals in the US have been confirmed positive for SARS-CoV-2. And this is 59% of the global uh, animals tested. Um, and this is as of a couple of weeks ago. Um, but we see that of the zoo animals, we've had 11 tigers, three lions, snow, three snow leopards, three gorillas, and a cougar. And I think the numbers have changed a bit since then. And then the wild mink. So uh, the animals confirmed within the U.S. by when we color code this out, um, we are looking, at, Texas seems to have the most confirmed SARS-CoV-2 uh, cases as of March 15th. And the mink, uh, they, they bear a special mention because of their unique sensitivity to this disease. So each month we hear about more mink and what they're doing about the problem with the mink because it has he heavily affected over, four, over 400, almost 420 mink farms have been affected by this. So we know that they're highly susceptible and, and we've determined that of course extra precautions must be taken to protect mink and the people because there's some evidence that mink can pass this disease back to people. And then we've got the 421 mink farms and 11 countries now uh, have uh, confirmed cases of this globally. And of course, Denmark is um, uh, the most heavily represented uh, country of the, with the most number of mink farms being affected by this disease. The United States is sitting at about 16 of the mink farms in the United States have been affected. So what are we doing? What are the One Health partners doing about this? What, they're looking into on-farm investigations. They're doing a comparative analysis of the so, SARS-CoV-2 sequences, see how they relate to one another. They're addressing gaps in the active surveillance for mink farms, and they're generating guidance and recommendations. And uh, they have some toolkits, and then they have what they call a zoo who call reporting, which is available each month. Um, the guidance documents um, are for the mink producers and also for state health, animal health officials and state public health veterinarians. And they consist of handouts and webinars and a toolkit uh, for investigating mink farms that are positive for SARS-CoV-2. The European Food Safety Authority report um, 
also we have information coming in for our our monthly meeting from all the what's going on in Europe and so we'll get a summary of animal testing and surveillance uh, efforts there and also their recommendations for surveillance on mink farms and whatever scientific reports have been published in the previous uh, time period. So here's one on monitoring a SARS-CoV-2 infection in Mustelids that was published at the end of January. So the key messages that we have now on mink is that there is no evidence that these animals are playing a significant role in the spread of SARS-CoV-2 to people. And for most people in the United States, the risk of SARS-CoV-2 infection from the animals is really quite low. There is a higher risk, of course, for people working on mink farms, and we've seen evidence of that. Mink farms need to follow available guidance uh, for the farm mink and for other mustelids that maybe live near their mink farm to prevent introducing SARS-CoV-2 to mink on the farms. And then of course, worker safety is critical to protect the animals um, and the people on the mink farms and mink farm workers with COVID-19 should avoid contact with other animals, especially mink. Um, so when the, they have sick employees, they need to just stay away if that's at all possible. So our group has looked uh, very closely at SARS-CoV-2 and large cats, and we've actually worked together and met with uh, the uh, Big Cat Sanctuary Alliance, and we have an upcoming meeting with them as well to discuss this because uh, we've had more than one sanctuary with animals that have tested positive. So they've been very cooperative and offered a lot of information to us about this disease in their, in their uh, collections of big cats that live at their sanctuaries. So again, here's the large cats tested positive for SARS-CoV-2 globally. You can just see that there's really just a handful of countries where this has been, uh, where they've tested positive. So in the United States, we've had seven facilities that have been affected and you can see the color coding here on the map of where they are. Uh, this again consists of 11 tigers, three lions, three snow leopards, and then the newer case of the puma in Texas. Um, we have uh, resources that we've been made available on animal susceptibility to SARS-CoV-2. And, um, and we have charts that tell you the type of the infection and whether it's a natural infection or an experimental one and what uh, the susceptibility of uh, that animal is to the disease and, and and it was great to have um, Haley also mention and discuss this a little bit, but th this is just another chart that just shows the experimentally infected animals um, that we are aware of. And then we've made, of course, the animal susceptibility chart, so that which ones are very susceptible, either based on the transmission between animals naturally or in an, under, under an experimental condition. And you can see there that we've had uh, even deer have been able to transmit the disease between themselves, but there's no evidence that wild deer have this disease. So our zoo and wildlife subgroup is made up of members from uh, the CDC, from USDA, uh, from the Department of the Interior, and from NOAA. And we have 17 members in our subgroup. So Dr. Jonathan Sleeman is our chairperson of the zoo and wildlife subgroup, and he typically would give be giving the talk, similar to the one that I'm giving today to update you on what we're doing with our One Health Federal Interagency COVID-19 coordination team. And so in this case, we have given guidance. Uh, uh, our particular subgroup has given, produced guidance to reduce the risk of SARS-CoV-2 spreading between uh, people and wildlife. We don't, last thing we wanna see is spillover into wildlife and then have a whole new problem arise from that. So we've provided some guidance, which we have um, on a website. Um, and this is on CDC's website. And what we talk about on the website is considerations for agencies or programs conducting wildlife research, wildlife management, and wildlife control activities. We also um, look at the uh, wildlife research and management control activities. And we have a hierarchy of controls to reduce the risk. We also have considerations for wildlife rehabilitation facilities, and we have uh, developed 
some uh, guidance for wildlife rehabilitation facilities. What do you do if you're rehabilitating uh, different sorts of wildlife that may be susceptible to this disease that you would like to release back to the wild if you can? We need to consider what we have to do to protect not only the animals from getting COVID from the people, but possibly people getting a disease from the animals. And then we've uh, worked on developing risk mitigation measures and then the hierarchy of controls to reduce risk of SARS-CoV-2 between people and wildlife. So these are links that we've provided on this page um, and you can, we should hopefully be able to make this available to everyone. Now our hierarchy of controls, uh, we, we put this colorful chart on and, and really basically what it suggests is that if you could eliminate the problem, which is physically remove the hazard, which means the people don't come in contact with the animals at all, of course, that's gonna be the best and most effective way to solve the problem of spread between humans to animals is just don't have anybody be in contact with the animal. Well, that's just not possible at a wild have life rehabilitation center or a zoo or sanctuary or anywhere else if people have to come in contact with the animals. And so if you can at least isolate certain people and animals from the hazard, maybe the engineering controls will help. But what it basically breaks down to is uh, you, uh, people, you want to protect the people who are working and interacting, interacting with wildlife by using the personal protective equipment and then training people to use this protective equipment properly. And just as Haley mentioned, uh, giving them a briefing on how to don and doff, how to put on and how to remove the, the protective equipment is uh, essential to making sure that everything works properly in the way that it should to protect the animals and the people. So a little bit about that. And then our companion animal subgroup will come up with uh, their reports. And I love their reports. They have the most colorful graphs of the, the symptoms of the different animals. And, and, uh, and I love the way that they uh, the graphically uh, show how these animals uh, respond to the disease. Um, so, so far, apparently we've had 113 cases of SARS-CoV-2 in companion animals and about 45% of these pets did not show clinical signs. And if they do show clinical signs, it's typically mild. And this just goes into the sites of signs you see, the sneezing, the coughing, and the nonspecific fever, lethargy, or possibly vomiting and diarrhea. So animal diagnostics and testing subgroup uh, chaired by the FDA and USDA. Um, they will give us a report uh, and uh, tell us what's going on and we'll talk about necropsy resources in a laboratory um, comparison or facilitating the necropsies in COVID positive deceased animals. And so they give us a good deal of guidance on this and they send out charts that make it easier than easy to fill out as to what the findings are and they make these available to people doing these necropsies so that we can share this information more easily. Uh, they also produce information about um, drug shortages or fraudulent products. Um, and, they'll, uh, and so this is the sort of part of the group that would be discussing some of the things that come up like why you shouldn't use ivermectin to treat or prevent COVID-19 and they'll, they'll uh, put out some uh, recommendations of, of some of the things that you'll see that are information that's passed around that is not accurate or that needs to be addressed. And so that they'll, they'll put out information to help give people the correct uh, information that they need. And then we talked about vaccine. Is there a vaccine to protect animals? And again, we'll just reiterate that it, there has not been any approved drug di uh, drugs for diagnosis, cure, mitigation, or treatment or prevention of COVID-19 in, in animals. So um, we do look to the Center for Vi Veterinary Biologics and um, we're right at this time, moment in time, uh, CVB has not licensed any products to diagnose, treat, or prevent COVID-19 in animals. And then they, again, I love the graphics that we get to see, but here's a graphic of the animals um, and how many uh, of each animal has been tested for SARS-CoV-2 and uh, it represented by states and the, num the little number in the 
the hexagon is the number of animals tested in that particular state. So you can see Massachusetts wins the big prize for having the most animals tested. Um, and uh, a number of the other states are, are uh, not nearly quite as close, but this gives us a, a great idea of how many cats, dogs, uh, tigers have been tested for this disease. So this just gives you a, a map of where uh, these laboratories are located um, in the United States and which ones are laboratory, uh, which ones are the NAHL and labs and then the ones that are just for testing animal samples and then ones just for testing human samples and then there are some that uh, can test for both with the circles around them. Uh, so this just gives you a sense of how many labs there are out there that can do this. And so far, up as of the 15th, uh, and I, I know there's a lot more than this now, uh, approximately 2.3 million human samples have been performed. So stay connected, they say. Uh, subscribe. There's a way to subscribe to the One Health newsletter. Uh, you can contact One Health at cdc.gov and, and you can sign up for these various uh, informational newsletters and the Healthy Pet newsletter. So um, uh, the ZUHU is the Zoonosis and One Health update call and so that might be of interest to some of you. So these are great resources and uh, just letting you know that the government is uh, addressing this in a very uh, uh, a lot of people involved in looking at this disease and trying to um, make sure we're getting everything right. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Gage. We appreciate that. Oh, great. Dr. Kramer has joined us and I'm gonna let him talk a little bit. I wanna introduce him to you. Dr. Scott Kramer is the Swine Commodity Health Specialist for USDA Veterinary Services. And we have um, enlisted his assistance in development of our next webinar, which will be April the 29th at 3 p.m. Eastern time. And we will have some information about that on our website soon. Um, but he's going to talk to us a little bit about African swine fever. So Dr. Kramer, um, welcome. Tell us a little bit about what we're going to learn. Hey guys, a great presentation by the way, great graphics and beautiful pictures. Um, so excited to be part of this group and present to you uh, the topic of uh, your, the risk of your sewage to African swine fever. We know African swine fever is pretty running, running rampant around the globe right now and so far it's not made it here. And the goal is to keep it that way. So I want to talk to you about the, the virus itself, what it looks like, how it's spread, and how you in the zoo population might be able to help keep that out of your zoo and keep your animals safe. I think a big topic we heard today was that um, you know, biosecurity is a way of life and COVID has helped us kind of learn how to deal with that moving forward. So we're all a little more uh, aware and uh, living that world right now. So uh, moving forward in terms of all these crazy things going on, I think that that's going to help us keep ourselves and animals and the zoo animals safe as well. So looking forward to sharing you my story with African swine fever and keeping your sewage safe in the zoos. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kramer. We really Welcome. appreciate that. Um, Ashley, do you want to um, kind of queue up some of the questions that we had? I, I saw some of them, and I think that uh, some of our speakers here might be able to address those. Absolutely. So thank you very much, uh, Drs. Gage, Kramer, Hall, and Nadler for everything that you've uh, presented so far. Uh, this is an opportunity for everybody listening in. If you have any questions about uh, what we've discussed today, to enter that ahead into the Q&A feature. And I will start out with a few. Um, we've had some that have been answered already by our speakers, but I'm just going to circle back in case anybody else has similar questions. I don't think those are, are viewable to everyone. Um, but first question that we had, and I believe this is for Dr. Hall, um, do you advise influenza vaccines for any avian species in the zoo settings, or um, do you just hope that it never comes into the zoo? <laughs> <laughs> That's a fair question. Um, vaccines are the topic of the hour and, and so applicable for everyone who spoke today. 
Um, so when we're looking at vaccines, vaccines are just another tool that we have, right? Another tool to go along with everything else we're doing to mitigate a disease. And Dr. Murphy spoke quite nicely about the biosecurity and the PPE and you know, all the other pieces of what we do to mitigate a risk. Um, so when we're thinking about a vaccine, that involves kind of an individual risk assessment of your facility, your risk, your animals. Now, when it comes to things like the avian influenza vaccine, that vaccine requires greater approval to use. Right, so that's not just a readily available, you know, order from your provider vaccine. So that's a conversation with your state um, and federal officials. And like I said, influenzas have so many strains. Um, so then it's also outbreak specific, and it's looking at manufacturers. So um, definitely something that is not a you just give all of your collection of vaccine, and it protects them for everything. We would love to have one great all-encompassing flu vaccine. Um, but it's definitely situation specific. So if risk changes, that's conversations with your local and federal officials. Thank you very much, Dr. Hall. Uh, and then we have a couple of questions that uh, I know Dr. Murphy spoke to in the chat earlier, and I'm going to combine these a little bit, um, but asking about the Zoetis vaccine and efficacy for some other animals. So binturongs, um, because they've been able to use ferret distemper vaccines in the past, um, other mustelids such as otters, um, and whether or not they might be able to contract SARS-CoV-2 or be uh, eligible to potentially receive a vaccine. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, I saw those. I think um, as far as vaccinating, um, you should talk to Zoetis, but the, you know, carnivore, it's being made for minks. And so I would think it would be fairly safe in the other species, as far as other carnivore species, as far as efficacy. And it's a recombinant subunit vaccine, which are pretty commonly used in, in, um, in zoo settings across multiple species. So we don't anticipate any problems as far as safety. As far as efficacy, um, it's found to be very efficacious in mink, but it hasn't been tried in um, other, uh, actually, he might have said they tried it in other carnivores, um, but I would contact Zoetis and talk to them about other carnivores. I do think the susceptibility is probably there, so it's probably not a bad idea. But like we've all said, um, risk mitigation, <laughs> it's all about that, right? So no vaccines ever 100% efficacious. We don't have studies in many of these species to test for efficacy. And so combining all of the tools in the toolbox are really the way to go, in my opinion. Thank you very much, Dr. Murphy. Uh, and this, this is a question that you answered again as well. Um, and I don't know if uh, Dr. Gage might have something to add, but there was also a question about mink. Um, and the impact is great to mink farms where they assume there are loads of mink in crowded uh, conditions, but what about mink in a zoo or an EZA setting? Well, I would be I would be very concerned about mink anywhere just because this disease seems so prevalent, so much more prevalent in mink than any other species that we have seen. And so if you have mink in your collection, I would do everything you can to protect them uh, from from getting this disease. I, I would imagine they're highly susceptible whether they're at the mink farm and I get it that the mink farm is going to be a, a completely different way to house the mink than it would be at the zoo. But just the fact that so many mink have, have been confirmed with this disease uh, and have pretty serious clinical signs as well versus think of all the dogs and cats out there that are living with people that have this disease and the people probably aren't protecting themselves particularly well around their pet dog or cat. And yet we don't hear an awful lot about that many animals having had it. Just it's in the hundred, it's, in, it's not even hit 200 yet for all the people that have had this disease. Uh, with the mink, it's, it's 100, over 100,000 mink have been affected by this. So I, I just, if, if I had a mink in my zoo collection, if I had a zoo collection, um, I would be taking every precaution to protect that animal would be, and I don't, I'm not sure if that's exactly answering your question, but that's what my answer is. <laughs> Dr. Murphy, do you have anything else to add to that? Nope. That's exactly what I said. So I do think the mink farm is probably those animals are probably under a lot of stress and crowded conditions with the, probably not the best ventilation, but the fact that we've seen so many cases and it travels through those 
those farms so quickly and causes so much disease, I think you're spot on. And, and I guess that lends itself to the mustelid question of protecting your other mustelids too. I just think it's it, it makes sense to take the precaution since we know that it affects mustelids, even though apparently only one ferret has tested positive for the disease. Now, it, it, we don't know how many ferrets have been sick and how many people have tried, you know, tested their ferrets and how many have come up negative. But the, to, to my knowledge, there's only one pet ferret so far that's come up positive for this. So maybe it suggests that ferrets are, you know, very different from mink and their ability to get to get the disease. But there again, and therein lies the question, is a badger, you know, or is a, it, it, are some other species going to be more or less susceptible? Um, I, I, don't, I, I don't know that I'd want to try to find out. I think I'd just make efforts to keep them safe. Thank you both. Uh, and just a reminder to anyone out there that does have questions for any of our panelists today, if you click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, that should give you an option to type those in. You are able to enter them in uh, anonymously, or you should be if you're a little bit shy, and we will get those answered for you. Um, our next question here that we have is, uh, again, something that was answered briefly in the chat, but in case anyone else has the same question, uh, has anyone heard of zoos regularly testing great ape collections for COVID-19, or are there any zoos starting to train great apes for voluntary nose swabs? So I can take a stab at that. I don't know if, if um, Dr. Gage wants to chime in, but it, you, in order to test your animals, you have to go through your state veterinarian has to give permission for that. And so it's not that um, it's not being done routinely as a screening test, unless you have an index of suspicion that you have cases. Um, and then the swabbing, the no swab training, um, I haven't heard of any zoos doing that, um, but it could be happening. I I'm not wouldn't know. Um, I think you've got to remember that we're also encouraging people not to get that close that that frequently for long periods of time. So to do a no swab, you got to be pretty close to the animal. Um, San Diego detected the virus in fecal samples um, and and then confirmed when they did the immobilization on the two that were pretty sick, and so. Um, yeah, I don't know of, of many people training for no swabs at this point, but it could be happening. Lori, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. The only thing that I've I've heard is that fecal uh, testing uh, feces is for big cats anyway is becoming a, a I believe a pretty accurate way to determine whether or not the animal has the disease, and so that's good because you don't have to swab the big cat's nose, and that that could be problematic. So um, I'm wondering if the fecal test might be the way to go. It's the least invasive method of testing. And uh, if it's considered to be an accurate measure, then it seems like that would be a, a, a good test to have. But again, you do have to go through your state officials in order to, at this moment in time, right. before you'll be able to start testing, right? And I think if, if you get a negative with clinical signs, you, you know, I'm not sure you can believe that a positive. <laughs> I might put more stock in. I think it's San Diego, and I don't have my notes in front of me, but um, when they immobilized your silverback, he was still positively shedding the virus, but his feces were negative. And oh. so species, I mean, they did pick it up initially in feces, but each species might be a little bit different too. So another quagmire to consider. <laughs> There's so much we don't know about the disease and testing for the disease as well. So. It's all, it's all pretty new. Hey, Dr. Murphy, a um, question for you. So have you guys, how do you guys follow up on these animals that are, that were positive, you know, with pe people, at least, you know, we have all these symptoms and things that keep on going on, um, like loss of taste or fatigue. Do you, how do you look at that with the, the apes in, in the zoo setting? Um. I think by the time you diagnose it and if you're treating it, you're you're pretty sensitized to watching them closely and then do subsequential immobilizations um, to, to to evaluate how they're doing. Um, you know, there's only so much you can do on an awake ape <laughs> that that would be diagnostic, but certainly the keepers are very sensitized to watch them. Um, as far as loss of smell and taste, I don't think we can ever judge that because they might go off food, but 
they might be off food because they feel really bad too. Um, Wait, do you guys have any radiographs? Do their lungs look any like human lungs would? With COVID? They did do radiographs in San Diego on the immobilized, on the two they immobilized, and they weren't typical of what they would expect to see in cases in humans. Now that male with the heart disease, um, that heart disease is is fairly advanced, but um, you know, uh, again, that's fairly common in older gorillas. So is it COVID related or not? I don't think anybody could say. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, and our next question that we have uh, looking towards the future for everyone, at what point, if any, do you think that SARS-CoV-2 will be just like other zoonotic diseases that we have to think about every day? Well, I'd love to take a stand at that. Um, you know, obviously it's, we're trying to look into a crystal ball, but I, I, I have a feeling, um, and it was backed up by a, a good friend and colleague, Dr. Daryl Stiles, who's with, with Veterinary Services, I believe that SARS-CoV-2 is going to become essentially part of our respiratory complex, right? Um, I don't know how widespread the, the vaccine campaign is going to be in the United States. We've certainly seen reluctance um, you know, in some populations to vaccinate. We've also seen, um, uh, you know, not just reluctance to vaccinate, but in some instances, uh, access issues. Um, we still don't know much about how it's it's working its way its its way through kids. I, I think for the for the foreseeable future, it will be here with us to stay for a while. And I think one of the the greatest things about this is, you know, we, we've we've looked and seen in this last year that, that influenza, the influenza A that Dr. Hall talked about earlier in people has, has barely made a blip on the radar screen. And it's because SARS-CoV-2 has taught us to wear our masks, social distance, wash our hands, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we're making some headway at respiratory diseases in general, but I do think that um, this, this COVID strain is, is here to stay for, for a little while. That's my personal opinion. Do you guys have any other thoughts about that? I just want to jump in from the epi side of things. Um, and, you know, there is a huge gap in knowledge, right? And we've talked a lot about how the vaccine doesn't have e efficacy data in a lot of the species that we're potentially about to start using it in. Um, and that is why is it just so vitally important that as much information about um, post-vaccination can be gathered as possible. Because if we're going to go through the expense and the effort and, and the animals, and we're thinking this might be something that's around for years to come, we need to start learning as much as possible about what's actually, you know, helping, what's not helping, what's causing harm, what's protecting against injury. Um, so it, it's so fantastic to have the zoo community where we can start to gather that post-vaccine data um, so that we can really make even better recommendations in the future, especially if this is something we're going to deal with for a long time. Thank you. Uh, we do have a couple more questions that just came in. Uh, first is in the CRC Handbook of Marine Mammal Medicine, there is mention of two harbor seal mortalities due to a, a coronavirus at an aquarium in Florida in 1990. Are pinnipeds considered high risk? I'm guessing that's going to be mine. <laughs> um, <laughs> I had the same question. I was concerned and I've been, um, I've talked to uh, Dr. Terry Rells, who's on, who sits on our subcommittee about uh, asking around. We have asked the various marine mammal centers if, if uh, that rehabilitate uh, pinnipeds, if they've seen anything that looks like a case. And at this moment in time, and, and these animals do strand so frequently with respiratory disease anyway. I, I, I don't know that you could state that there's any real difference uh, in the no amount of respiratory disease you see in stranded marine mammals to begin with, especially pinnipeds. So I have not heard of a case yet, but it's something I would want to know about and, we, and certainly it raises a concern. And I'm hoping at some point we will be able to test 
different species to see if we're seeing any evidence of this disease. But at this moment in time, to my knowledge, there have been no uh, reports of uh, this disease in pimpinets or in cetaceans for that matter to my, I haven't heard of any. And hopefully we would be, someone would report these to our, our groups. Um, so I would, you know, maybe the next, next month we'll hear something new, but at this moment in time, I have not heard of this. Thank you, Dr. Gage. Uh, and then we just have a few minutes left. So I think this will be our last question for today. Uh, this question is for Dr. Murphy. Um, do you think that great ape encounters and behind the scenes tours of ape facilities or training sessions at training panels near guests will ever return? And if so, how long do you think until that type of activity can resume? Yeah, that's another crystal ball question. Um, you know, I think it's, it's too early to know when they will return. Um, I think probably when we get human herd immunity might be the time to start discussing that um, and what that will look like, I think will vary by zoos and the risk. So, um, you know, do you make the guests uh, approve vaccination and have them wear PPE or um, how far away can they be and what are the circumstances? Um, of those interactions. So I think a lot, a lot's gonna depend on the circumstances in each facility. Um, I don't know of any facilities doing anything like that right now, but we're pretty far away from, from herd immunity. I don't know when that'll be. Thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you everyone so much for uh, dedicating your time today. I'm gonna to turn it over to Dr. Nader to close us out, but very quickly before I do, uh, when you're leaving today, those of us that have stuck with us to the end, you will get a survey that pops up and we greatly appreciate if you could just take a couple of moments to fill that out and let us know your thoughts. We will have a link to the recording of this webinar available on the ZAP website and information about the African Swine Fever webinar that was mentioned earlier today that Dr. Kim will be leading for us in April will be sent out via our listserv. So if you're not already signed up, uh, please join that. We will be posting that to the site as well. All right, uh, and Dr. Nadler, if you just wanna sign us off. Great, thanks you guys. Ashley hit all the important things. Uh, please, if you have sewage or if you are in a facility where um, feral swine are known to uh, uh, be present in your state and there's not many states that don't have them, uh, we highly encourage you to join that webinar to understand a little bit more about this uh, this scary pathogen that none of us really want to think about. So again, the, the microbes seem to be winning. They're throwing us curveballs. So please join us at the end of April. Um, and thanks all again, our speakers and our attendees. More soon. Thanks. Thank you.